So, um, yesterday afternoon, I was chatting to a mate of mine. Um, we were talking about my 50th, which was my, my wife had had a surprise party for the week before. And we were having a good laugh because we had a really good night. It was a surprise party. And I walked in, I was expecting to have dinner with some friends. And I walked in and there a bunch of my mates were. And it was just a massive surprise. And a week later, after this, I was, was actually about half a week, I was chatting to my mate and he was driving along in his car and he had his, he had his hands free on and he was chatting away and we always have a good laugh, I always have a good laugh with this guy. And all of a sudden I just heard this almighty smack and it was just like this, he just, he just went, mate, mate, I've got to go. And, and then he just hung up. And I'm frantically trying to call his wife, I couldn't get through to her eventually got through to his daughter, Tess, and uh, I said, you know, I don't know, your dad's been in an accident, I, I, I don't know how bad it is, um, you know, you need to get hold of him and that sort of thing. Um, I later found out that his wife was blissfully having a massage at the time, and she, so her phone was in another room, but sort of she had 17 missed calls on her phone and obviously was very concerned when she picked up the phone. And what's happening in business is a bit like that right now. You know, it's like, everyone's just getting slammed. It's like things are getting disrupted and everything's getting commoditized and we have to find a way to cut through. So um, today we're gonna to be talking about business storytelling, okay? Now business storytelling is an incredibly versatile tool which can be used in all manner of um, business. You can use it um, strategically, you can use it in uh, connecting, you can use it for six, to communicate success, you can use it to um, overcome anti-stories. There's so many, so much versatility to business storytelling, so I'm going to be sharing a little bit about that with you today. As Diane said, uh, my background is in business. Um, I've had three successful businesses. The first one was Listen Clothing. At the age of uh, 23, I started that business and um, I had a I had a vision of, I don't know, you're probably a bit too young to remember, but they were back in the day, they were pumping um, sewage out into Bondi Beach. Does anyone remember that? It was a big problem because Bondi being, you know, our iconic Australian beach, and they're taking this raw sewage and pumping it down a pipeline and putting it into the ocean. And I came up with a t-shirt idea around that, which revolved around surfing. And, um, and it, was a, it was an idea that I thought was going to make me millions of dollars. I thought it was a really, really clever idea. And I got t-shirts printed up and, and everything was good. And you know, we tried to get them in to some of, the, uh, some of the tourist shops over there in Sydney, some of the, 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 sh the shops that sell these types of t-shirts that appeal to tourists. Um, but it wasn't that successful. But what it led to was a bigger concept, which was a company that we called Listen Clothing. And Listen Clothing was an idea of actually promoting um, conscious messages, environmental messages on t-shirts, but done in a tasteful way, not in a way that uh, is like, you know, really crass or, or really simplistic, like save the whales. We did it in very, um, uh, in, a, in quite a, uh, um, well, it appealed to a lot of boutiques, put it that way. So we did it in a very stylish way. Um, so that was my first foray into business and it was a, it was a really great business because I was so passionate about our product and I was passionate about our message. I had a strong sense of why. And one of the things that I want to uh, appeal to all of you in this room who are contemplating going into business or are already in business is you have to understand your why. Because especially in the times that we are now, the, the, the landscape is so disruptive and there's so much competition and it's so commoditized that we have to know why we're in business. 
that is the thing that's going to make us stand out. That's the twist of the screwdriver that's going to make all the difference. It affects the way that you communicate. It affects the tone of what you do, right? Because a lot of people go into business for the what. You say, well, why are you in business? And people will give you an answer of what they're in business for. They're in it for the money. They're in it for the prestige. They're in it for, um, you know, to create passive income, whatever it might be. But what I'd really encourage you to do is just go a little bit, bit below the surface and understand what it is if you are contemplating going to business or you are in business, how many layers deep can you go with your why? Your first why won't be the why that is, that is an effective leverage over you. It'll be something deeper. Okay, they say sometimes that your why makes you cry. So it's anything that sets emotion off a little bit in you will be a big clue. And often it could be something from your childhood. It could be something that happened to you as you were growing up. It could be something that happened to you from a boss, from a parent, from a relation or a friend. You know, we have things happen in our lives that become the stories that we start seeing the world through. And that can become our why. That can become the reason that we do something. So you'll see someone, great performers. I don't know how many of you watch The X Factor. Who watches The X Factor? No one. No, that makes me feel really silly. But I love The X Factor because what The X Factor does is it shows... Does everyone know what The X Factor is? Right? So it's a talent program where people come on board and sing and compete and they get judged. So you'll find the people... Excuse me. The people with the strongest sense of why are the ones that have a resonance, which is... That is actually the X factor. It's the why that is your X factor. Yet so many businesses don't have the courage, they don't have the vulnerability, and they don't have the foresight to go there. And what I'd really encourage you today is whatever you're doing in your life, whether it's studying, whether it's, your, whether it's a business that you're starting up, whether it's in relation to your family or whatever, get a hold of that why and contemplate it deeply. I had one mentor who suggested asking why. He used to, he asked it for six months. What's my purpose? What's my purpose? What's my purpose? You'll find that when you start doing this, it becomes highly addictive. And there's a sort of an edge to it that is different to just living on the rat race in the normal humdrum of life. I've got a model that I created. I call it the AMP still, stillness model. And the AMP stillness model basically says that it's, it's two triangles, one at the, at the top, there's a line, and then another triangle below. And the top line is all about what we're aiming for, what we're trying to achieve in our life, the boxes that we're trying to tick. And we're always trying to tick boxes, we're trying to achieve, trying to get somewhere else. And that's really important. I think it's human nature to be striving the whole time. But in the process, we have this mind that's going round and round and round, doing the same things sometimes sabotaging us, sometimes holding us back. And it just spins round and round and round telling us the same old stories. So one of the things to realise is that we have this, these inner stories that are shaping our life. It's like a set of glasses that we see life through. Okay. So if there's a scratch on the lens of your glass, you're going to see a scratch out there, right? And it's the same with our internal stories. So we want to go for our goals, we want to achieve but we also want to be aware of what's holding us back. And it's often our stories that hold us back. I was sitting down at Fantastico. Um, does anyone know where Fantastico is? It's a little restaurant in Subiaco. It was a winter's night. I was sitting there and um, my wife looked down at my, um, at my wedding ring and it wasn't there. I've been married for nearly 20, 25 years in February next year. And she looked down, someone just went, wow. Were you yawning or were you going, wow? No. <laughs> <Don't be joking. laughs> so she looked down and she said, where's your wedding ring? And I said, I gave it away. She goes, you what? I said, I gave it away. And she noticed my watch was missing as well. And I'd given that away. It was a beautiful four grand tag watch. I'm talking seven years ago, seven or eight years ago in 2007. And I'd just come back from a fairly um, radical personal development course where they'd asked us to hand over something that was going to rattle us a bit, right? Rattle our internal stories. It was all looking at our internal stories and how they can be really stressful and how most of our stressful stories can actually just be a lie that we tell ourselves. So anyway, 
everyone was asked to do this exercise and we all handed our stuff over and all of us just started to freak out, you know, because people were giving over things like wedding rings and watches that were very, very valuable and also meant a lot. I mean, if you think about the story around a wedding ring, it's a massive story, right? Also around an expensive watch, it's a big story. That's how watch companies can command such a big price for their watches. If you think Rolex, you know, you think there's a whole story attached to it. It means prestige, it means that you're wealthy, it means that you can afford a Rolex. We have all these assumptions if someone's wearing a Rolex watch. It's just storytelling. It's the stories that we want to believe. It's the stories that we tell ourselves. So anyway, we'd handed over these things and so many freak people freaked out that the organisers of the event said, look, okay, look, maybe, you know, you can have your stuff back, right? So some people took their stuff back and some people didn't. I was one of those that said, look, I, you know, I want to play this game and, and see what I'm going to experience. I want to see what this is, this is all about. So I, I didn't take my, my things back. And, um, and so uh, I'm sitting in this restaurant and my, my wife's crying and I had to explain my way out of it. And fortunately, I've got a very understanding wife and uh, we're still together to this day, I'm happy to say. And um, so it's just an example of, it's a radical example of how we can, we, we can see that our internal stories are how we see the world, okay? So when we've got these internal stories, it's important that we become aware of them so that we can kind of untie them. And that's a whole other conversation as to how we actually do that. But these stories, these stressful stories that we all hold can be untied. How do we know that these stories are actually not the truth? Well, we know they're not the truth because everybody has a different experience. So one person, something that stresses one of you out is not gonna stress somebody else out, okay? And similarly, something that makes one person happy is not universally gonna make somebody else happy. So we know that these are only temporary, they're not the truth, but they're a big part of our life and we have to deal with them every day. So that triangle below the line, I call this line that sits between these two triangles, I call that the line of courage. And the reason I call it the line of courage is that when we start to question our stories, our whole world kind of gets a bit rattled. We actually start to crumble a little bit because it's the stories that are the kind of the concrete structures that keep us enmeshed in a particular way of seeing the world. But if we start collapsing those stories, there's something else there, okay? And I call that, that's the lower triangle or what I call below the line. So I call that top triangle the ant triangle. It's where we're going for it. We're trying to tick some boxes, get some things done, reach our goals, achieve, do all the things that the that Western world tells us is, are good for us. And yeah, let's face it, we need to make money. We need to be able to support ourselves. We need that. That's an important part of life. But then there's a whole other part of life and you'll notice it's a triangle with no base. It has no construct underneath it. And that's really something that is undefinable, okay? And that is what is there to support us when all these stories kind of crumble away. So I just mentioned that, and the ultimate aim is to integrate those two things. And I just mention that because that is where you'll find your power. That is where you'll find your why. Integrating those two things, knowing what you want, but knowing that some of the things that you're chasing are not actually the truth. We use them to get to a certain place, but there's a bigger picture as well. Understanding the smaller picture and the bigger picture is really important, and having that driven by a sense of purpose and why is really important as well. And these are all stepping stones, you know, these are stepping stones to getting what you want in life. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is actually throwing out one or the other, okay? You need a balance between these two things, and that's a a huge conversation for another time, but I just wanted to mention that. So we've got this whole internal world of stories, and then we've also got a whole other world of external stories. So after I discovered the power of internal stories, I, I started to also see in the market that there was a whole other world of storytelling. And of course we've got the storytelling in movies and in theatre and in the entertainment industry and they're probably the best known stories. You know, they're the hero's journey, what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey. You know, 
Um, the young warrior sets out on a path, gets challenged, almost dies, you know, faces more adversity, comes through the hero of the day, and then their story just continues, always being tested, always being on a journey of, um, um, of having to achieve something more. That's how the story goes. And you'll notice these stories contain many of the same elements as business storytelling. They have the strong characters and they have the ups and downs. But the difference between these, what we call big stories and the stories that are more um, business related is that we try and tone things down a little bit when we're, when we're talking about business storytelling. We don't want to be saying a big narrative like, the sun was setting in the east as the bird flew across the sky and cast its shadow on the ground below where the pebbles glistened in the sunlight. You know, that's not business storytelling, okay? That is what, that's like a Hollywood story. So with our business storytelling, there's a number of different rules that we want to observe and one of them is we don't want to put on a storytelling voice. We want to just tell it as if we're talking to a mate, you know? And this will give us more credibility in the business arena. There is a big difference between the way Hollywood tells a story and the way we need to tell a story as business people. So, and that's a, that's really um, that's a that's a real uh, really good thing actually because a lot of people don't tell stories because they think that they have to be highly descriptive or they have to tell something that's really impressive. And I just want to put you all at ease and let you know that that's not the case at all. So for those of you that are more left brain orientated, you can still tell stories very, very effectively. And there's actually a, there's a, there's a way to do it that uh, I'll give you some of the ingredients of how to do that today. So business storytelling is all about getting across a message in a way that is effective. And the reason that it's effective is, well, there's a couple of them. Firstly, when we talk in abstracts and jargons, which is the way a lot of the business world tends to talk, we lose people because it's just meaningless. I mean, we've become through politics and also, also through business and other forms of communication, we've actually become really numb to big words and fancy sentences and politicians that don't answer questions or businessmen and business people who don't answer questions they just speak in abstracts and that just it's meaningless the reason storytelling cuts through that is that storytelling is concrete by definition we're telling a series of events we're reporting what actually happened in a moment you'll notice when I told the story about my friend uh, Terry when he got hit by this, that was a that was that was a true story of him getting hit by a car yesterday when I was on the phone. Always wondered what that would be like, uh, because you know I you know I'll, I'll will admit and I hope there's no cops watching this video, but you know occasionally I'm tempted to pick up my phone and I see a few sniggers in the audience, so I suspect that some of you are the same. But it's not a good practice, of course, and. Um, and so it was, it was, I was freaking out when I heard that because I did not know how badly injured he was. I didn't know whether he badly injured somebody else. I didn't know that he was on hands free. And it started triggering all these stories within me as to what was the story, what was his story. And it just shows again the power of stories and the way we always see things in stories. In the bigger one day workshop that I run, um, there's one video that we show which demonstrates this really well, um, which uh, I won't spoil it actually because in case some of you do it, I don't want people knowing what that is because it's a bit of a test to show you exactly how powerful storytelling is. So it should be a bit of a, um, a, a relief, I guess, to know that uh, you don't have to be a master story. You don't have to be really fancy when you tell your stories. We're just capturing that moment in time. And what I often encourage my audiences to do is find a time in the last 24 hours that they can report as a story. So I might just challenge you, all of you today, like what is it, it's uh, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, so you've had a full day, you've had a full 24 hours, there must have been some things, some events that have happened in your life. Has anyone, and, and I just want to point out that when you're practicing your storytelling, it doesn't have to be an event that's a big event, like you know someone getting slammed in the back, by a car, but it, 
Okay, I just want to ask the audience, is there anyone here who's experienced something today which was a little bit out of the ordinary? Anything? It's hard actually when you actually just put it that way, you know, but I can guarantee that within this audience there'd be someone here who would have experienced something just a little bit out of the ordinary. Something that wasn't quite the same. So this is called story spotting when we start to recognise the stories that are happening in our life every day, okay? It's actually a skill once we learn it, it's impossible actually not to spot the stories that are happening in our lives. And the way that we do that is we identify time, we identify place, okay? So for me, yesterday, the time was I was in my kitchen. Um, it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. My friend was driving his car. I don't actually know where he was, but he was driving his car somewhere. Um, and the same goes for business. Uh, there was a... Um, uh, there was a, a the ex um, National Australia Bank CEO, a guy called Cam, Clyde Cameron. Uh, he famously walked into the organisation when he started there and ripped placards that were on the meeting rooms, which said "reserved for general managers only." He ripped them off, and a number of people saw him do that, and that story triggered throughout the organisation. So that is another way that we can create stories and we can and we would tell if we were in that organization that's a story which we might tell because we saw it happen you see what i mean these stories are happening around us all the time and they don't have to be your stories the number one best thing to do is actually to identify your stories they're the most powerful they're the ones that will have the most cut through but there's a lot of other you can get your stories from books you can get your stories from other people you know, especially when you're starting out and you haven't maybe got as much experience in business as you would like, then you you can find these you know these other ways of, of telling your your stories through other people and, and other people's experiences. So, um, so storytelling is, as I said at the outset, an extremely versatile, uh, really extremely versatile um, tool. I say that storytelling is a little bit like a knife, right? You can use it to bludgeon someone or you can use it to cut an apple or a piece of meat or fish or whatever. So really it can be used for its rightful purpose or it can be used in a bad way. And I really encourage you to use storytelling in a good way. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool is what I'm saying here. So the reason that it is so powerful is that it it actually evokes certain chemicals when we when we tell a story there's a recent article in the Harvard Business Review which talks about this and it says that when we're doing when there's when we're re reporting the downside of a story the sad part or the part which is sort of someone's struggle it releases cortisol into our system which is a stress hormone and then when things get better when there's sort of the happy ending we experience more of an uplifting experience through oxytocin being released into the uh, into the system, which is a feel-good hormone, or, and like a um, like it's like a drug really, but it's produced in the body naturally. Um, we see ourselves as the hero of a story, so we see ourselves as the person central to the story. So we really find ourselves connecting to the person telling the story. We couple our M MRI results have demonstrated that we actually our brain activity mirrors the person that's telling the story. So all these sorts of biochemical reactions are going on and all these um, physical reactions are going on uh, which make us very much engaged in the storytelling process, both as the, as the teller and the listener. Um, Steve Jobs said that, and he was a brilliant storyteller by the way, and the thing about Jobs is he really did recognise this connection between the inner and outer world of story. Uh, I don't know how many of you read his book or watched the movie Jobs, but you know, he, did, you know, he did a bit of LSD in his time, and, and my personal, I've got no proof for this whatsoever, but I actually believe that he blew his internal paradigm so wide open that it left him able to create a company like Apple. Because as I said before, this is all about my stories are, are very much a mindset. So if you've got a story that you can't tell a story, you will not be able to tell a story. And similarly, if you've got um, stories from your, uh, from your upbringing that are playing around 24 seven like a loop, going round and round and round, it's very difficult to um, have a vision 
which is massive because your nervous system will be locked in to a certain way of being and your brain patterning will be in a certain way of being that just won't allow you to play as big a game as what you want to play. So my personal theory on that is that Job's kind of, you know, he understood this at some level. He really blew that paradigm apart, was able to have the vision for Apple. And he said that storytellers um, will rule the world. He said storytellers will set the agenda, vision and values for a generation to come. Now that's a very, very powerful statement from, uh, from a man who had extraordinary success. So, um, so uh, Jobs really knew the power of storytelling. Um, so with your storytelling, one of the things you always want to do is, or well, the first thing you want to do with your storytelling is use it to connect. And connection, how do, how, I always ask, how do people, connect, how would you connect at a dinner party? Um, how would you connect at a dinner party? If you're sitting around people that you don't know, what would you do? Um, say hi. Yeah, um, introduce yourself. Yeah, introduce myself, ask about their background, yeah. what they do. Yeah, great, awesome. Yeah, that's generally what we do, isn't it? We, we would introduce ourselves, but then we would try and find out a little bit about them. And then what would you do after that? Would you, if you, if you... find some common ground. Brilliant, thank you. So that's spot on, right? So that's what we, that's what a lot of us do naturally, right? We try and find some common ground. And so the research shows that people like doing business who are like us, okay? So that's the number one thing. You wanna find some common ground. You know, if you're into surfing or you're into yoga or you're into, you know, food or, you know, cycling or, you know, studying a particular subject. Um, I was giving us a, um, a talk this morning at, uh, just actually over the way here in, at, the, um, at the UWA club. And um, uh, we were talking, I was talking to, to one woman there and she was uh, doing PhD in biochemistry. Uh, actually bioscience it was, and it was a really interesting subject where she's studying the stem cell research of breast milk of all things. And so my father, he was a PhD in biochemistry, so, and I actually did science at UWA. So we kind of just found this common ground and had a really good conversation based on our, you know, the things that we had in common. And, and all of a sudden, you're, you know, you've got this connection with someone. So it's really important to take an interest in people when in the storytelling process and, and tell your connection story. Out of this, we can find certain connection stories we can have different connection stories for different situations, right? So you might have one connection story which is business related, you might have one which is a sporting biz, uh, connection story, um, you might have one which is a study connection story, uh, you know, you, you can have a family one, you have all these different points of connection uh, in your life, okay? So, um, and there's lots of ways of triggering those stories and they're usually questions that start with uh, where or when. Okay, time or place. Now, time or place is sort of the, the triggers that, that start the story off. You know, so just yesterday I was dot dot dot, or just earlier today I was you know doing A B C. Okay, I was at um, I was at the Bloom Lab and I gave a talk about storytelling. Okay, so. Uh, yesterday I was at Bloom and I gave a talk about storytelling. So you can throw yourself into a story with time and place. It's a really good way, if you're struggling with the storytelling, if you're struggling with a way of, well, how do I throw myself into this? The best way is to throw yourself into it with a sense of time and place. Excuse me, I'm just gonna have a glass of water. Okay, so that's the the next thing you want to do when you're creating a connection, and this is definitely the second thing you want to do, is you want to find a point of difference about the person and, it, and maybe communicate a point of difference about you as well. Now, you don't want to go straight in there and communicate some point of difference straight up. I've actually had some challenges with this before. You know the story that I told you uh, about the, the watch and the ring. So, that story I told uh, at a big corporation, and when I got the feedback forms, it was the feedback was great. I had this had one person, and, and it was a woman who had said, uh, "Your story didn't help me connect with you at all." Okay, and I totally got that because you know, like for a lot of people, 
giving away your wedding ring would be probably highly offensive and giving away your expensive watch would probably be considered extremely stupid. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I can totally understand that. And they were the very same stories that were going through my head when I actually did it. So I totally got it. And it was a big lesson to me because, you know, you can think that something that is unique to you, I like to push myself a bit, I like to push the edge a bit, but some people might just think that that's outright stupid. So if I lead with that, I'm kind of taking a big risk, you know, in terms of my connection with people. Um, but some people might go, geez, that's really cool. And other people might go, mate, you know, what were you thinking? You know, so you just need to be a bit careful with it. It just depends on your character and your personality as to what you want to do. So then, then so as I say, so the next thing is actually identifying that, um, that piece that's something different about you. You know, what is it that sets you apart from everybody else? Okay, and that's the way that you tell your connection stories. Okay, now as I said before, there could be lots and lots of connection stories. You might have five or ten business connection stories. If I was telling a connection story here, and I didn't actually do this, but I would tell the story of how you know I graduated from UWA in 1987. I did a Bachelor of Science degree. Um, I started out studying geology actually, but they booted me out after the second year. And, uh, and I went and saw the sub dean. I still remember, he had sort of a Scottish sounding name, McConaughey or something like that. He was a really cool guy actually. He had a, he was this dean, he sort of had sort of hair down to his collar and he had, I remember he had an earring, a piercing as well. And I sort of thought, because I always had a vision of sub deans, you know, with, uh, you know, the, what do they call those cloaks that, that uh, the academics wear? What are they called? They've got a name, haven't they? Come on, you must know. No one knows? Can someone Google it? Um, <laughs> so, you know, the cloaks, the typical cloaks that they wear, I was really expecting to see when I walked into the sub dean's office. And I sat down and I had to negotiate with him because I had to get through this degree. You know, my father was a PhD in biochemistry. He lectured, at, he graduated from UWA, you know, went and lectured at Stanford University. I was gonna bring shame on my family if I didn't get through, right? So. I'm kind of joking with that, but that was my story at the time, you know, it really was. I, I had to get this degree. I wasn't really happy at university. I didn't really, I wasn't passionate about what I was doing, but I had this story that if I had a degree, everything would be okay. So I kind of went on this university journey and, um, you know, so I'd tell a story something like that to connect with an audience like this, you know, because that's, that's your story right now, you know, you're at university and you're... Um, you know, you're doing the university thing, and um, so that's my point of connection. So that would be my that would be my academic connection story. If I was talking to someone at school, um, someone from school, I'd have one from my school years and my experience there. One of the things I want to say about that though is notice that that story that I shared it wasn't all positive. It wasn't like <clears throat> you know it was all rosy and I went through and got all A's and. You know, there were a lot of challenges for me. I mean, I actually started university, I quit, went and worked up in Kalgoorlie for, for two terms of university, came back, did a, my three year degree in four. Do you know what I mean? So it was just like, it was always, university was always a, was always a struggle for me. Um, and so that vulnerability piece of being prepared to share something that where you're not a big star in life, because life's not like that, is it? You know, we've all got challenges, and it's actually, interestingly enough, in storytelling, you'll endear yourself more to people with the challenges that you face rather than, you know, the glory days, right? But that's what you see a lot of people in storytelling getting wrong. They want to share all the good bits, and they fail to share the bits that were tough or a bit grubby, okay? And what I'd, what I'd really encourage you to do is get the ups and downs of the story. Make sure that there is some ups and downs because if, it's, if there's not, people are just gonna, they're just gonna switch off. It's not engaging. And also using characters um, in your, so if you've got some strong characters in your story or you're the strong character, you can share some insights around that. But it's basically called the V word, the vulnerability word, right? Vulnerability is something that is such a powerful tool for you in business and in your life but most of us are trying to avoid it because it goes to a place where we have to really feel something. And storytelling is all about feeling. You know, it's, it's basically, it's defined as, um, as uh, facts um, delivered, with emo delivered with emotion, facts 
and context. Facts delivered with emotion and context. Okay, that's what a story is. That's how we define it. So, um, so you've got that 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 formula for the for creating connection. And it's really it is the foundation for all other business that you'll do. You need that foundation to make sure that you've got a good relationship that you can then use other story structures um, together with that. Um, so, are there any questions or comments at this stage? I've been talking for a while now. No? Okay, right. So, um, so there's a, there's a couple of rules that you probably want to observe uh, when you when you're telling your stories. I mean, what's the what are some of the negative connotations if someone says, you know, I'm going to tell you a story? What, what what are some of the negative connotations around that? Just kind of like being lectured. Yeah, it can sometimes feel like you're being lectured. Yep. Anything else? Pretty much boring. Yep. Right. You can be, oh god, this is going to go on forever. This guy's going to when's he going to shut up? You know, like that. That's why I shut up, by the way. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. So, yeah, and it can be, we can have really negative, negative it's like it can be a fantasy, because a lot of stories that, you know, we read kids and that sort of thing are sort of, you know, they're fantasy stories. So we have that connotation that they may not be truthful, they may go on forever, um, and could be like kind of, well, here we go kind of an attitude, okay? So we just need to be mindful of that. And I'm um, just going to give you two rules when you're telling your stories. Don't lead with, I'm going to tell you a, a great, I want to tell you a great story. Segway into your story in some other way, okay? Try and find a way of segueing into your story that is, um, uh, you know, I, I just had this situation happen to me yesterday. I, you know, I was talking to my mate on the phone, da da da, and then you're into it, right? It can take a bit of practice because we use that. Story, we use that thing. I want to tell you a story. It's a bit of a crutch, it helps us, you know, it, we think it helps us segue, but it takes away so much from what you're communicating. You will not have the cut through if you use that. The other thing is in business storytelling, you really want to keep your stories pretty brief, generally under three minutes. Okay, so you don't want to go under over three minutes, and sometimes your business stories can be a lot shorter than that, and you want to make a point when you're doing that. Um, and um, yeah, so some of the things that you probably do want to do when you're telling a story is you maybe want it to have a bit of a twist. If it's all just linear, and as I said before, if it's just on, if it just sort of uh, hasn't got any ups and downs, it's probably not going to be very engaging. Okay. Having said that, when you've got your training wheels on for storytelling. Doesn't matter. Just just tell your stories. Get in the habit of throwing yourself into a story. Where you would use abstract description of something or tell it as a case study, try and identify a story that backs up what you're saying. And this could go in your essays or you know in your anything that you're doing. You know any sort of piece of work or um, uh, research that you're doing. Try and find a way of communicating that through story. We had a very, very, um, we, we tested this on a lot of people where we give them a case study which has lots of dot points. And the one case study that we share is around, um, actually, I better not share that one, but, but one of the case studies uh, is like if you were sharing something that was very technical and then told that as a story wrapped in emotion about someone's experience of that very same case study, you will find that people will remember the story and they will remember nothing about the case study. We've tested this quite extensively. So I just encourage you to find for every case study, for every piece of opinion that you have, find a, a personal anecdote or an anecdote from somebody else that supports that and will make your communication very powerful. So stories are just so powerful. Uh, I just want to really... Um, I really want you to understand that to get cut through in this disruptive and commoditized market, um, you know, you do need to tell your stories. But one of the things that really often it's, it's, it's things that happen in a social situation. I was at a friend's 50th, um, uh, it was early last year, late last year, and um, I, I looked across the bar, uh, we were at, it was actually at the Rottnest pub, 
and um, I looked across the bar and there he was with his uh, family, but they weren't really his family anymore because he was divorced, but he'd asked his ex-wife along to the, uh, to this, um, to his 50th birthday party, which I thought was a really noble act actually. And his three sons were there as well. And um, uh, they were about to have their picture taken. And his ex-wife, as the photographer was there about to take the picture, just sort of stepped out of the frame. And um, John, my, my mate, just kind of grabbed um, Jenny and just pulled her back into the frame. And I just remember thinking how awesome that was. And it really touched me very deeply that uh, and I was just thinking, you know, what is that? And it was, the, it was the, the story that that was communicating was one of respect. And I think that this, you know, this R word, this respect word is a big part of storytelling. When we can tell stories that communicate values that are important to us, they have emotion. And that is what helps people really connect with us and connect with our message. So, um, yeah, we need to use our stories to cut through. We need to use our stories to stand out from the crowd. We need to use our stories to connect. And we can use stories for so many other things. Um, it's just the list is as, as long as my arm. I've just shared the tip of the iceberg today. So I really hope that's been helpful. Thank you. Do you want to take any questions? Yeah, I'm very happy to take questions, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. So one of the things you can do is be really upfront about it, right? So you just say, look, you know, I know, especially if it's some opinion that people have got about, um, you know, about you or, you know, it's like, I know that some of you are thinking that, you know, what I did wasn't right here. And I just want to say, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my finest hour, you know. However, you know, I've done a number of things and, you know, then you, you go on to communicate what your strategy is to make things better in the future. But the number one thing is just admitting the fault right up front. Yeah, it's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any more examples of you yourself using storytelling, say, in any companies you've worked in, in, in pitching anything? Or? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, when I was, uh, it's a, there's a, so there's one time when I was I was pitching for a, a real estate um, speaking gig, and I was putting together some marketing material, right? And I just thought, well, I, if I'm if I'm in storytelling, I better tell a story about, you know, why you should hire me, okay? So there's a number of different types of stories, but one, one of them is, is sort of, you know, like a big picture sort of story. So I, sort of, I, I basically said, look, you know, back in the day, the real estate industry used to be really simple for real estate agents. You know, it was like real estate agent had all the power. There was no internet, so we couldn't access any. You had to, had to go to a real estate agent. And then basically the landscape changed with the internet and all the information that's available. Anyone can get the information that a real estate agent can get. Um, and, and that means that you know you need to do something different in order to get your message through, to have cut through, and actually you know uh, communicate with your audience and be relevant. And that's why you know you need you need to be able to tell your story and the stories within your business so that you can resonate with your client because they've got all the same information that you have. And this is what I was saying before about <clears throat> everything's becoming commoditized. You know the real estate industry is becoming commoditized. The stockbroking industry is already commoditized. You know, engineering is becoming commoditized. Architecture is becoming commoditized. Accounting, everything. You know, it's just flat, flat, flat. So, you know, if you can send your, you know, your your engineering work up to Manila to be done, then why do you need to engage a big firm that's going to charge you, you know, a lot of money? You need another way of of cutting through. And I'm suggesting that storytelling is is one strategy for that. There was another situation where um, 
I'm a surfer and uh, you know I live um, lived down south for five years prior to this I've just come back to Perth in January of this year and uh, we wanted some action around you know the sharks there's it's a dangerous thing to say in any audience because uh, you know it's such a polarizing um, topic but we wanted some we didn't want the, the, the hooks and things that they had there but we wanted a, a situation where if a shark was threatening a surfer that that shark would be dealt with, you know, only when they came in and they threatened the surface that there would be a rapid response to that because we were losing a lot of lives down there. And um, so I wrote, um, and through using storytelling, I got appointments with uh, Colin Barnett uh, face to face, you know, um, soda water and cucumber sandwiches in a, in a meeting room, and, um, and uh, Troy Buswell as well. So, you know, we were able to have great influence to, uh, to get what we wanted that way. Mm. Anything else? Yeah. So, um, if you want to pitch a business idea, um, how do you get the right balance between the story about why and your technical thing is your how you're going to execute it? Yeah. When you're pitching to someone. Yeah, great. So the question is just for the video. So the question is, how do you get the balance right between the how and the why of pitching in a um, in a business? Um, it's a, in a pitching situation, you mean predominantly? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So basically, you don't want to overuse story. I'm not saying use story for everything, right? I'm just saying have it as part of your toolkit, right? And use it probably a bit more than what you currently are. Try and use it, you know, as, as frequently as you can, you know, within. But it annoys me when I hear people just telling telling back to back stories. So the way that you can do that is just. Don't lose the don't lose your actual um, descriptive way of saying things, but try and find a story that demonstrates what you're saying. Always just have that, even if you don't tell it, because what it forces you to do it keeps you really honest. Because if you can't find a moment in time when that was actually the case, then what you're saying doesn't carry a lot of weight. You know, it's like. If it doesn't work, I have a philosophy, you know, it's a, a great Lakota chief called Sunbear said, don't give me no philosophy that don't grow no corn, right? And that's, you know, that's what I believe. Storytelling is a, is a tool that helps you grow that corn. Um, but it can be overused, you know, you don't want that gene genetically modified Monsanto stuff, you just want the regular corn, right? So, yeah, that was a joke, so. <laughs> You're welcome to laugh. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, so the, in terms of the why, I mean, that why is going to be very, um, that's probably going to be personal. There's, there's lots of different levels of why. But why, why are you in business? And then why is your vehicle, whatever your business is, why is that the right vehicle to solve the business problem that you're trying to solve? That's the question I'll be asking. And then you can answer that with, um, yeah, with, with all the different tools you have available to you including storytelling. Yeah. Did you want to answer a question? Yeah, um, just quickly. Um, do you think the limit of storytelling um, uh, possibly extends to simply sort of one-on-one -on -one or sort of in-person in kind of situations? Or would you say you can use it en masse to cut through to people? Absolutely en masse. I mean, you know, you look at, you know, you look at someone like Steve Jobs or, you know, Obama or, you know, they use it you know, on mass and, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, JFK, you know, Nelson Mandela, you know, all these, all these um, great leaders were extraordinary storytellers. And once you start tuning into it, you'll start to see it more. When you're not tuned into it, it's sometimes hard to see. So yes, um, definitely one-on-one -on -one and on mass. I guess um, what we've been talking about here is largely oral storytelling. When you transfer it, but you can be transferred into the written word. You just have to be a little bit careful because it doesn't always translate directly because a lot of our communication is, it's just a fraction of the words, and, and but it's also body language and voice and tone and those sorts of things as well. So that story may not translate as powerfully in the written word, but it still has, has real cut through, I believe. Yeah. Cool, okay. No, okay.